Today is the second IOSH webinar brought to you in collaboration with the World Health Organization and the third in our series of webinars so far. In the next 90 minutes, we'll examine current risks, challenges and practical measures in protecting health workers in response to COVID-19. Those people most closely, directly and immediately involved in this crisis are, of course, health and social care workers. And we dedicate today's webinar to their safety, health and well-being. IOSH members worldwide have led the way in enabling businesses and organisations to respond appropriately during this crisis. They continue to protect colleagues and prevent ill health as well as helping millions of workers adapt to new ways of working and new challenges. I'm really proud of how our profession is responding. Thank you all. Now let me introduce you to our presenters and their topics today. First from IOSH's Health and Social Care Group, representing members who work in public and independent health and social care. We're pleased to be joined from its committee by Chair Mark Parsons and his colleague Fiona Potter. They'll outline particular risks and challenges faced by staff in health and social care settings, the existing guidance and the measures being implemented, and the issues and questions that need to be answered right now. In the next section, we'll have an opportunity to hear occupational health experiences from other countries. We hope to welcome from Beijing, Dr. Zhang Min of the Chinese Academy of Medical Sciences, and from Italy, Professor Claudio Colosio from the San Paolo Hospital of Milan. They'll comment on coronavirus lessons learned in both China and Italy. And then finally, from the World Health Organization, we're pleased to welcome Alice Simnicianu of the Infection Prevention and Control Team, Catherine Kane from the WHO's Health Workforce Department, and Occupational Health Team Leader, Dr. Ivan D. Ivanov. They'll provide us all with important global updates, especially continuing challenges faced by health professionals and their emerging recommendations. The WHO is continuously improving and enhancing its advice and guidance. And many of you will already know that a survey is live online this week to gather OSH professionals' experience of protecting workers in essential public services during COVID-19. If you haven't yet completed this, I urge you to please do so, and we'll share a link with you after this webinar. After our presentations, a panel of speakers will have time to answer some of your questions. So please take this opportunity to submit them throughout the webinar, and we'll address as many as we can. I want to emphasize that this and our other webinars are a platform to inform and engage with safety and health professionals and others responsible for safety and health at work around the world. We want to support you with this regular platform for engagement. And this two-way channel, giving you the opportunity to share support and guidance on the evolving issue wherever you are in the world and whichever industry sector you're in. So we'll only comment today on those matters that benefit the health and well-being of workers worldwide, especially those in health and social care. Now more than ever, organizations need authoritative, useful, relevant advice and guidance on managing the safety and health of their workforce. Please visit IOSH's website, IOSH.com, for the continuously updated COVID advice and guidance that we're producing for the OSH profession and all organisations on managing the response, keeping staff safe and healthy at work. We've got a member of the IOSH team taking care of the technical aspects of this webinar today to help run this as smoothly as possible. So before we begin with our speakers, let me quickly run through some housekeeping points with you, please. All attendees on this webinar are muted. On your screen at the top left hand side, you'll notice a small bar with some written options on them, which are chat and Q&A. If you've got any technical issues or audio problems and need to message us at any point, please use the chat option. Please be aware we're connecting presenters from around the world, so we may experience connection issues that are beyond our control and dependent on their own connections. If that happens, we'll simply move on to the next speaker. If you have any questions for the presenters relating to the content of the session, please post them using the Q&A option. That way I'll be able to see them and ask them to the speakers for you. At the end of the presentations, that's where we'll run through those questions. So you have plenty of time to get your thoughts and questions in. We've got much to cover. So I'm gonna ask all speakers today to keep to their allotted times. And oh, finally, just so you're aware, this session is being recorded for future playback and sharing. You'll be able to come back and watch the webinar again whenever you wish. You'll find it on the irish.com coronavirus page. So 
Let's get going. Let me welcome from the IOSH Health and Social Care Group, Mark Parsons, to give your 10 minute presentation, Mark. I'd be grateful if you keep this to this time. Thank you. Hello, is that better? That's better. Thanks, Mark. Okay. We can hear you. Welcome. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, Andrew. Uh, I can only reiterate what Andrew has just said uh, on the dedication and commitment of uh, our health and social care workers, of which IOSH Health and Social Care Group um, actually represent uh, throughout the international community and hopefully uh, we'll get some uh, positive learning from this today. Uh, I'm just going to point out a few of the, the challenges that I know I've had within our organisation and, and colleagues have had uh, throughout the IOSH network uh, and a lot of that is the uh, guidance that we've received from the World Health Organisation and public health organisation for the respective nations uh, of it not being consistent so the inconsistency has been there uh, which hasn't helped uh, and obviously the interpretation of that guidance as well uh, by not only different countries but different individuals working within the health and social care sector. That has then uh, led on to uh, a major issue with the supply and demand of personal protective equipment. Uh, unfortunately the, the media have uh, not helped with uh, certain things but you know I can talk for our area that we've got sufficient supply uh, but again, the, the visibility along the supply chain, whether that be uh, internationally or within the, uh, the home nations, um, the feedback we are getting and what we are seeing is that the, the visibility isn't there for what PP is coming through the pipeline uh, to alleviate people's uh, concerns. Uh, and that links into the logistics then of uh, the actual supply chain itself. The other thing that uh, has been a, a major concern is the testing of frontline staff or any staff involved with uh, health and social care, uh, knowing whether or not they have uh, been uh, classed as COVID positive or not. Um, and again, this leads to, to further anxiety. You know, and it is after all about the well-being of our staff that is most important uh, because without them, we can't care for the patients uh, that we, we care for. Uh, so I think the support going forward, well, not only now, but going forward to deal with the emotional uh, uh, well-being of our staff going forward is going to be paramount. And I think, you know, the addressing these early on uh, and having the support mechanisms in, in place uh, will truly help. Uh, and even so for, for health and safety professionals like ourselves, because of all the things that we are dealing with as well. Um, but, you know, I can talk you through some of the the issues that we've had particularly within the supply of PPE you know uh, it wasn't coordinated we've now put that in place we've got central uh, emails so it's streamlined uh, we've got a better uh, vision of it locally now uh, and again systems that we put in place here I'd be more than happy to to share and put on the microsite uh, if that was beneficial to people um, but the whole point for this for me is about learning from the international community. You know, there are other uh, nations that have gone through this and are further forward than what we are in the curve of uh, coronavirus and how they've dealt with it, how they've managed their PPE supply, etc. And the different mechanisms that they've put in place in which to uh, control or uh, mitigate those as much as possible. I don't know whether I've run out of time, Andrew, but uh, I could go on a lot longer about different issues, but I think it will take us off. A few more minutes, Mark. Um, okay. you're, you're very welcome to, to share another three or four minutes with us. Okay. Uh, so another area of concern, uh, yeah, which we have a good guidance out, is about the reporting, you know, the, the riddle uh, reporting in, in relation to, to COVID-19 uh, positive staff members uh, and the contracting of that, whether or not it has been identified as being clearly through a work activity uh, or a lack of uh, having processes in place or was PP provided etc. Um, you know so they have given good guidance but again this leads to interpretation and it would be nice to have uh, a more defined element I suppose from the HSE if that was possible and I know within the the various forums I've been part of because I also chair the IOSH uh, Southwest uh, Health and Social Care Group as well uh, and we often have uh, questions coming in about is this one reportable or not uh, and again different different people's interpretation on how that guidance should be should be followed so i think there's going to be plenty of questions going forward both on pp and riddle uh, as well as many other aspects as we go forward with the with mm -hmm. these topics in, in fact mark i can see in the uh, the questions from uh, 
delegates on this webinar with us. There's lots of questions already about PPE. Could, could you perhaps give some, some broad views on what people should do when they're struggling to get PPE? What types of PPE are appropriate? Is an N95, N99 mask suitable? I, I uh, think... N3? I, I think, you know, depending on what you're dealing with, obviously FFP3 is the one which is identified for any uh, aerosol uh, generating procedures. Uh, I have seen a document by the HSC, and again, I'm not sure how widely known this is, uh, that they've actually looked at the N95s, and there is a recommendation in there uh, that it could be used uh, in addition to FFP3 if that uh, was not no longer available. And again, we can share that on the uh, the microsite within IOSH so that members ha have and others have access to that. Thanks. That'll be useful, Mark. And, and, and we, can, uh, we can see actually that Dr. Claudio Colosio from uh, the hospital in Milan is wearing a mask right now as he's preparing for this webinar with us. So we'll ask the same question to him uh, at the end of his session too. Okay. Hey, Claudio. Good to see you. Thanks for coming over with us. Uh, and again, I think, you know, with, with any sort of PPE, you know, I've done a risk assessment for our organisation as to uh, what, we, what we do when we've got sufficient supply, if it gets to a critical stage, if it goes beyond critical. Uh, hopefully we'll never get there uh, because, you know, from what I'm seeing the, in the supply chain going forward, it looks as if it's starting to come through a little bit more uh, steady than what it has been. Um, and again, seeing it on a piece of paper and see it arrive at two different things. Uh, but again, uh, the, the noises that I'm hearing are encouraging. Uh, but again, you've got to look at, okay, do we go through the normal supply chain if, uh, through the NHS or healthcare sectors? Uh, or social care sectors uh, do we, and some of the things we are looking at is through suppliers that are being verified so we've got the uh, SMTL which is our laboratory the test kit um, so again anything that has uh, a, a, an FFP rating on it we are saying all oh, that has still got to go through SMTL once that's been verified then we can purchase uh, those items from that supplier mm. Any tips for people that are struggling to get supplies of, of PPE at the moment, Mark? Any inside track you can offer? I, I think, you know, the, the, the key to this is working with your procurement teams uh, within the regions that you work in, uh, because, you know, they're there to help. They've got different avenues. Uh, and again, it's, it's reaching out to the business community as well. You know, we've had good links here with uh, Tata Steel and, and others uh, that, have, you know, they source an awful lot of PPE themselves, which are... Uh, compliant to the, the necessary standards uh, and you know we've received a fair bit of uh, supplies through that route uh, and again as, as in all Wales uh, we've gone out to businesses throughout for any help and support that they can provide us and providing we get those checks and balances in place to make sure that it is fit for purpose because the last thing we want is giving staff a piece of personal protective equipment which they believe is going to protect them and hasn't been verified. Yeah, right. And, and in fact, I, I know in the session uh, later when we have our guests from the WHO, we're going to hear a little bit about pragmatic use of PPE and get some guidance there. So thanks for setting that up for us, Mark, and, uh, and beginning this conference for us. Thank you very much for, uh, for being here today. No, it's a pleasure. Any benefit to our members is a positive. Absolutely. Yes, thank you. So let's now turn to experiences of COVID-19 in other countries around the world. It's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Zhang Min from the Chinese Academy of Medical Sciences in Beijing to give a 15 minute presentation. Uh, Dr. Min, we'd be grateful if you can keep to this time. Go ahead and please share your screen with us now. We had some technical difficulties with the connection with, uh, with, with Dr. Min earlier in our preparations for this call. So we'll just move straight on to Professor Dr. Claudio Colosio from Italy. Uh, Claudio, 15 minutes for you, please. We'd be grateful if you could keep to this time indeed. And uh, welcome to unmute yourself and share your screen with us now, please. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for having invited me here. I want to share with you the experience we are running here in Milan. As, uh, as you can see, we are now in the hospital and we are managing patients and contacts uh, and we have done some uh, activities in the field of pre uh, prevention. Uh, now it is not this one. One second, I go to the presentation. Thank you. Hello. Let's see. 
if you hit the uh, bottom mark share screen at the bottom of your Zoom window, yes, you should... I, I see one second. I think now should work. Ah, yes, here it is. Can you see? Yes, we can see now. If you can, that's it. Perfect. Off you go. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. So I take 15 minutes just to tell you that uh, maybe some of you know we are a WHO collaborating center active in Milano. And one of our term of reference is uh, healthcare workers uh, protection and prevention. So I will uh, show you something regarding the current situation in Lombardy, the epidemics in the hospital, the main data obtained from our colleagues uh, for the first for a while, not only colleagues, but also patients, the main clinical findings, and uh, I will raise some conclusions which, which uh, due to the situation uh, which is running, uh, are necessarily very preliminary. We will see how the situation will uh, evolve. So this is uh, uh, a picture on what's uh, happening in, uh, in Italy. And this is very impressive, is what is happening in the region of Lombardy, where we had uh, about uh, 60,000 cases uh, with more than 11,000 fatalities. Now the situation is improving, but this is uh, the main uh, finding now. Um, at the beginning, we felt ourselves safe. It was, uh, we had the feeling that uh, we were protected, uh, that COVID were not entering the hospital. But uh, when one day, one colleague resulted uh, infected by COVID, immediately we started uh, our activities to understand uh, the contacts. And uh, it is impressive. We found 242 contacts for a single worker. He was symptomatic, he was the first case. After that, we spent the first days running around the hospital to find the cases and exposed. And uh, this has been our main job for uh, several days. Finding uh, cases, finding close contacts, and trying to find a way to avoid further uh, infections. So we established to define uh, close contacts, which are our main point of interest. And close contact is any person who had a face-to-face -face talk without personal protection or spent more than 15 minutes in an indoor environment without personal protection with any coronavirus infected person, patient, colleague, general population, uh, uh, whatever. And then at the beginning, we also searched for workers who had recently traveled from live in area with ongoing spread of COVID, uh, where at the beginning was considered a tiger risk. We didn't know that very soon we would have been an area even more risky than one. Maybe my friend Min is listening to my presentation. She will be impressed by that. At the beginning, we thought that was China, but then we understood that it was Italy, the problem. So uh, the protocol was nasopharynge was swab for PCR to detect the coronavirus. And at uh, the beginning, we used to meet workers uh, with uh, some symptoms, uh, but uh, very soon we understood that it was not uh, the only possible way forward. Uh, and so this is more or less our approach. Uh, if uh, somebody is a close contact, uh, even without uh, symptoms, uh, we use to perform a nasopharyngeal swab. Uh, then, after having done this, uh, we used uh, to admit, in any case, a worker to his uh, regular activity with mandatory use of personal protective device, uh, surgical mask, and where necessary gloves, uh, and uh, to do similar approaches in family and around in Milan. 
in family also mandatory to take meals separated, to live separated, etc. And then uh, if the swab resulted positive, we asked the worker to continue for uh, 14 days in quarantine. But uh, I want to tell you that we asked the worker, uh, even when negative, and even when he continued to work, uh, to continue to use this kind of uh, um, preventive measures, because in some cases, the workers become positive after a while. So we want to avoid the risk. If uh, uh, the worker was with symptoms, uh, more or less the same approach. If it was uh, in uh, our hospital, immediately swab and then home and then uh, quarantine and then 14 days after the recovery, two swabs in two consecutive days to check uh, to the results, uh, both negative readmission to the work. Uh, Okay, with a follow-up for the whole period. Uh, we had also another problem. Uh, so, so, in the previous slide, I've shown you how we manage close contacts with or without symptoms. Okay? Uh, but the second problem is, when there is an epidemic around, there is also the problem of the admission at work of workers who has been sick without having uh, done any uh, nasopharyngeal swab. So we don't know why they has been absent from work. So we decided to collect a telephone interview to any worker who was absent from work, in particular if the absence from work was critical. Uh, let's say around 14 days or, or more. And then uh, at the interview, we asked the presence of uh, typical symptoms. You can see here, I don't want to spend time to, to mention each one, but I want to remind you that anosmia, algeusia, conjunctival hyperemia, and diarrhea are typical in the mild or very mild coronavirus infection. I did some diagnosis just only based on anosmia and diagesia. Okay, then in these cases, we are, uh, may manage the patient as a COVID patient, even if there is not any previous swab. And so we admitted work only after 14 days without symptoms and after two swabs negative. Yeah. On the other hand, uh, if uh, the um, Duration of the disease is not critical. Absence of work is short, no contacts, no evidence of these problems. So we uh, deal with the worker as, uh, is, as, uh, as uh, he was uh, a close contact. So swab and continue working after your return. In case you become positive, quarantine. Okay, Claudio, if I can just ask you to go back one slide, please. Yeah. You, uh, in, in section two, you, uh, you list some symptoms there. It may be that I'm the only one that doesn't understand what some of them are, but could you just give me a very quick uh, introduction to what dyspnea, anosmia, agusia? Anosmia is a difficulty in uh, uh, feeling odors, uh, odors. Sorry, and the uh, ability to smell. Loss of, uh, agusia is loss of taste. Okay, yeah. Anosmia is loss of smell. Okay, good. Loss of smell, loss of taste. I made some conclusion, some confusion, but it is, uh, I want to tell you that it is typical because uh, uh, coronavirus is strongly neurotropic. Got it. So okay. very often uh, there is a neurological syndrome in patients. Right. And how about dyspnea? What's that? What? Dyspnea. Dyspnea is... Uh, um, Difficulty in uh, uh, breathing. Okay, difficulty in breathing. Okay, good, thank you. Okay. Sorry, it is a babel, the bubble tower of the languages. <laughs> well, together we can make it, uh, make it work with the translation. Thank you. Okay, then more or less here you can see our investigation. Uh, from one side, uh, identify close contacts. 
and uh, from the other side uh, to isolate the close uh, contacts uh, to do nasopharyngeal swab uh, and to define which uh, is uh, infected because uh, the second message i want to give you is that uh, in uh, healthy workers in a group of healthy workers uh, very often you can find even 85 90 percent infected without symptoms with it, this is a big problem if you don't identify the contacts the infection goes everywhere so here it is the story you can see that at the beginning yeah red the infection came mainly from uh, worker to worker uh, we did, maybe we medical doctor know that the patient uh, may be dangerous, but we cannot imagine that uh, our colleagues can be, okay? So we live with our colleagues, we go to the canteen, and the other infection spread. So second very important message is take care of the contacts among workers. Uh, at the beginning, it was easy because the contacts were symptomatic. After 15, 20 days, uh, contacts were not symptomatic. So it was even more difficult to manage the situation. Then we created this questionnaire in a Google form. We, when uh, uh, subjects were at home uh, waiting for the nasal swab result, or because of sick, we asked them to fill in this form every day, and we have collected 15,000 days observation. And now we are working on these 15,000 days of observation. And some findings of the observation is that very often they do, do not have fever. Let's say in the papers published right now, you find that uh, the COVID patients suffer fever. Uh, the, mild, uh, the mild infection does not uh, have uh, fever. Uh, it is uh, 10 days, uh, we measure downstairs fever to anybody entering the hospital. Nobody was rejected because of fever. But we found in the last 20 days, 40 persons COVID. So they were with COVID without fever. Here you can see another very important point that is uh, very, very few subjects with uh, heavy symptoms. Some subjects with moderate symptoms, light symptoms, and absent, absent symptoms. So this is uh, the real problem. Uh, and this is the reason why I think that the cases in our region and probably everywhere in the world are more than anticipated because we don't know how many are asymptomatic and with infection. Here is the prevalence of uh, anosmia, uh, loss of uh, uh, smell, and uh, uh, dysgeusia, loss of taste. It is important because it is diagnostic, commonly reported and persists for a long time after the recovery from the infection. Workers still suffer these symptoms. This is what we've done right now. Our hospital counts on 5,000 employees, more or less. Total swab 2,800, more than 50% of the workers. Total positive, less than 200, 185, now total recovery 74, and now in this period we are, we are observing much more recovery than the new cases. So we are in a good situation now. Uh, the percentage of positive swaps is uh, when you do uh, active search of contacts uh, in the order of 10%. And here another very important message to you, colleagues, friends, uh, that if you do uh, without any criteria, sampling, as uh, from March 25 was requested by our law, you risk to do big mistake because when we did it, we got a percentage of positive less than 1%. So you, you should 
count on the active search of cases. And uh, these are the results. I'm going to them because I don't want to take time. Thank you. Uh, where are the remaining? You sorry? Just two minutes remaining, please. Yeah, yeah. I will finish in two minutes. I promise. Uh, then uh, you can see um, our finding, and uh, uh, our finding is also regarding personal prote protection that a surgical mask, if well worn, give a very good protection. Only, uh, only in case of uh, activities generating aerosol, it is necessary to use more sophisticated and complex masks. Mm. And uh, this is uh, uh, the first, there are the first two slides. This is surprising. I want to tell you that uh, the, the duration of uh, the infection is longer than anticipated. Because at the beginning, we saw that it was uh, been about 14 uh, uh, days, 14, 15 days. See, uh, our average is uh, 22 days. Our range is from 12 to 46. But uh, in 16 days, uh, only 11.5% recovery. In 17 days, uh, is plus uh, 6 plus 8%. Between 12 and 70 days, only 25%. So we are, we are wondering in Italy in these days if it is a good idea to make the quarantine longer, longer more than 14 days, in order not to do repeated swaps to the subjects. Because we found if we find the positive after two swaps, we must keep the worker in quarantine for a week more. Mm. Uh, so what we're doing? We are experimenting a new questionnaire. We are just yesterday finalized a new proto prototype uh, using telemedicine with the possibility of monitoring people with uh, a simple uh, uh, smartphone. And the second thing we are doing, we are on the workers who suffer an infection, we are now measuring uh, the serum concentration of IgG and IgM to validate a test that is very promising but still not enough validated to be um, recommended for the routine uh, evaluations. Okay, I think that's all. I hope I stayed in the time and I really thank the 1,000 people around for this very kind attention. Thank you. Thanks, Claudio. Great to have you there. And if you could just stick with us for a few moments, please. Um, you, uh, you mentioned the, the future study on IgG and IgM. Can you just explain what that study is looking for? What, what's IgG? What's IgM? Ah, okay. So immunoglobulin M should give uh, information regarding a recent or very recent infection. Mm -hmm. So if I find in a worker elevated IgM, uh, this is uh, a good uh, uh, suggestion for a uh, nasopharyngeal swab. Right. So measuring IgG is easier than running a nasopharyngeal swab and with IgM you can uh, uh, reduce the number of nasopharyngeal swab. Uh, the second point, IgG is long-term immunity and we have two problems here. The first is that we don't know uh, how time elapses from the infection to the synthesis of IgG. And the second point is that since the coronavirus is a big group of many viruses, most of them give only just a very, very mild rhinitis, we want to be sure that the IgG we measure are the IgG of this coronavirus. Okay, and I think that doing this study in which we will involve some hundred subjects who has been in fact infected, and the same number of subjects who had a negative nasopharyngeal swab, we can get this information. This is our idea. 
Excellent. Thank you. Claudia, I've got a couple more questions for you. If I could ask you please to stop sharing your screen, that will allow you to be, be present on the video monitor for us. So if you click stop share, and then great, we should be able to see you now. And uh, all of those who, who are watching, you can tab up to the top right corner and click on speak of you, and then you get a full picture of Claudio and his team. Claudio, obviously we can all see that you and your colleagues are wearing face masks there. So I just want to try to, to galvanize some of the questions we're getting from the audience around face masks with some specific questions. So um, I, I, I've started growing a beard during coronavirus. Uh, what about people with facial hair? How, how, do, uh, how do face masks affect that? Okay, so uh, let's say, first I want to tell everybody listening, 1,064 person that if you have not had yet an epidemic in your country, please buy masks and uh, create a good, uh, come si dice, uh, a, a good storage of masks. Because in Italy, at the beginning of epidemics, we were really desperated. No mask in the whole country. Because China, India, Malaysia stopped it to export, and we do not have our own production. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is necessary to use in uh, some way masks. And my, in our experience, this mask, the one I'm wearing, that is uh, the typical and simple surgical mask, it is not considered uh, officially a personal protective device, but uh, uh, in our uh, group of uh, three, 5,000 workers, 3,000 observation, nobody who wore this mask was infected. So this is my first suggestion. Okay. Then, of course, if you have uh, the most sophisticated with valve, uh, etc., uh, you can use that in the COVID uh, departments uh, just uh, to create a bigger, uh, a, a major uh, uh, level of safety. Ah, okay, because by the way, we have been forced here to close some departments, uh, for example, child neuropsychiatrics doesn't work anymore. These are uh, women. My sister, she's a neuropsychiatrist and she's working with us because for the time being, uh, her department is closed. And uh, so we are open new department of COVID patient, just only COVID. And here yeah, it is logical to use uh, the most sophisticated masks. Good. And in any activity, in any activity in which there is the risk of the creation of aerosols. Mm -hmm. So even with people who are asymptomatic, they're not showing any symptoms of coronavirus or COVID-19, they should be wearing masks too. It sounds like your general guidance is we all need to be wearing masks. Yeah, if I want, if I can I tell you that, uh, it's easy to say later that we did a mistake. But at the beginning, our recommendation was only to ask symptomatic patients to wear masks, and this probably was a mistake because we, was, uh, we are not aware that 80% of the person are, symptomat are not symptomatic but are, are infected. Ah. So maybe if you, have an, if you have enough mask, because a big hospital like my one needs uh, every day 6,000 masks. So very often <laughs> the, the masks are over very, very soon. So, so we, we're hearing that it's very difficult to get masks around the world. Um, wh what about masks that are homemade? For example, a material folded and put over the, the, the mouth or a scarf that's lifted up over the nose and mouth. Is that acceptable? Oh, I thank you. It is a very good question because you know that in Italy now, some very important uh, uh, firm of uh, fashion has switched to the production of masks. Uh, Hermene uh, Gildo Zegna, or uh, they produce masks. Gucci also, Gucci, masks. So let's say, in my opinion, is the problem are the droplets. Of course, it is good to have a mask specifically targeted for that. But if you're able to produce with this profile, even if they're not yet. Uh, endorsed, uh, they're not yet uh, uh, 
by the, the European Union or you can use. Uh, for example, we had a problem because uh, when we got some masks from China, they have not the same classification as European Union. So trade unions say, but would this mask work? And we answer it, but you prefer not to have any mask? Okay, um, and, and then let me just ask one final question about masks, because I'm, I'm, I'm hearing this strong guidance from you that we all need to be thinking about masks. I just want to be very clear. In a hospital, I can see you and your colleagues wearing masks all of the time. Uh, are you advocating that anybody in any workplace should be wearing masks all of the time? Or are you advocating more broadly that all of us, including when we go out for a daily bit of exercise, a walk around our town, or, or to, to go to the pharmacy to pick up medication, everybody should be wearing masks all of the time? Wh which of those two are you pointing okay, to? Okay, let's say we are in, in our region about to enter the so-called phase two. We would like to reopen activities starting from May the 4th. And the decision we took is that everybody going around after May 4 must wear masks. Otherwise, they will be punished. It will be the, our regional law. And I want to tell those of you who has been lucky, and I hope you will remain lucky forever, of course. But don't forget that if you very early create good prevention, you can avoid the dissemination of the infection. The inf in my experience of, as medical doctor that this infection goes 10 times quicker than you can even imagine. If you spend six hours without mask, then you five 300 contacts. Okay. Claudio, it's excellent to have you and your colleagues with us. Thank you very much for sharing your results of your research and your experiments so far for the clarity of the guidance that you've given to us too. We hope that you'll come back and talk with us on a future webinar and give us updates on the research that you're doing. For, for now, uh, we'll say thank you very much to you and ask you to, uh, to step back and put yourself back on mute again. Grazie mille. Ciao a tutti a Milano. It has been a pleasure for us staying with you, really. Also because we are alone, we are isolated because of <laughs> this. Ciao, grazie. Ciao, grazie. Okay, uh, we can see some questions coming through in the chat, of course, asking whether uh, Claudio Colosio's slides will be available after this webinar. Yes, indeed, they will. You'll be able to see Claudio's slides that he shared with us uh, on the Irish.com website, looking at the coronavirus homepage where you'll find a link to the replay for, for this webinar too. But uh, let's keep things moving. Uh, let's go across to the, United, uh, for, to the World Health Organization now. The WHO's primary role, as you know, is to direct and coordinate international health within the United Nations system. And its main areas of work includes health systems, non-communicable and communicable diseases, and preparedness, surveillance, and response. Uh, we're gonna have uh, three guests from the WHO. Alice Simiciano, Catherine Kane, and Ivan D. Ivanov, with 15 minutes to talk to us there. Please welcome the team at WHO. Dr. Ivanov, go ahead and share your screen, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it is a great pleasure to, to be with you, and uh, we learned a lot from this uh, webinars in WHO. That's why we're keen whenever we have the opportunity to attend the webinars and from your questions and from your discussions, uh, we, learn, we learn quite a lot. Thanks, Ivan. It's great to have you back with us. If you could switch on your video, please, and, uh, and then share the screen. We, we look forward to hearing from you and your colleagues. Yes, and uh, I'm happy that my, my colleagues, uh, uh, Alice Misiano from the Infection Prevention and Control, and uh, Catherine came from Health Workforce, were able to, to talk of WHO. And uh, we want to share with you some thoughts about uh, dealing with health and safety of health workers in COVID-19 in a more comprehensive way, not just with masks. Alice, are you? Yes, hi, Ivan, I'm here, thank you. Okay, go ahead. Okay, thanks so much. So hi there, my name is Alice Simniciano. I work on the infection prevention and control team at WHO at headquarters. And I just wanted to touch uh, on the 
work that we are doing around the healthcare worker infections and just to to let you all know the type of problems we're having and what we are trying to do about them. So first, uh, what you see here on your screen is uh, what type of cases get reported to the WHO that identify as healthcare worker as an occupation. And as you can uh, infer from the numbers, they are nowhere near the correct number of healthcare worker infections. We know countries like Italy, Spain, um, and many others around the world have reported thousands and thousands of infections. However, they're not reported to WHO, so it is hard for us to have exact numbers or even a good idea of what the true numbers actually are. So what you see here is of a, a very limited um, number of reports that get sent to us. And uh, there are whole regions missing from this reporting, as you can see, Afro and Sierra. So, um, the data that we have available to us is very, very limited. Um, and some of the, the, the cases and the information that have been presented have, and from anecdotal um, reports, have told us that a lot of the occupational risks for healthcare workers are that uh, they don't often know the patients are suspected of COVID or find out too late. And by that point, they haven't uh, put them on precautions or applied the correct PPE. And just, just to let everyone know, because I know there were some questions in the chat about the precautions and the PPE, um, we didn't include them in these slides, but WHO does recommend droplet and contact precautions uh, for COVID patients suspected or confirmed and airborne and contact only for aerosol generating procedures. So that's where we differentiate between the medical mask and the respirator mask. So just the medical mask is recommended by WHO for routine care of COVID suspected or confirmed patients. And so some other factors that were rec recognized from healthcare worker infections were working in high risk departments for long hours, um, suboptimal infection control practice adherence, especially to hand hygiene and PPE, as I mentioned, um, often not having sufficient training or updated IPC training and large exposure, uh, long exposures to a large number of COVID patients. Yeah. So I won't dwell too much on this slide. Um, as I said, it's not very good data, but this is what we are working with. And so if we move on to the Thank next you. slide, Yvonne. Thank you, Alyssa. Well, in addition to the COVID risk, currently everybody forget that during career and be exposed also to blood and other body and to tuberculosis and uh, even in tropical countries to malaria if they work in the field but also they suffer fatigue they suffer heat stress there are data about damage uh, health skin damage from working in PPE there can be a risk of back injury from patient handling for example putting patients in intubation requires special position that needs six health workers to put the patient in that position in a safe way without damaging their back slips trips falls needle stick injuries enormous psychological distress even cases of there is uh, we're concerned about the emerging evidence about the increase in stigma and the attacks against health facilities that we pay every day here on the balcony the health workers translate also in and do not harass do not assault health work harass health workers health workers they before and during after their deployment in COVID-19 healthcare facilities and they recommend Ivan, I'm sorry, we're getting some connection Thanks. problems with you there. Um, could, uh, could perhaps Catherine or Alice take over the remainder of this slide? We're struggling to hear you, Ivan. Okay. Uh, Catherine, you can go ahead. I, I think you're on mute there, Catherine. Absolutely. Um, so overall, and, and Ivan, I hope you can continue to drive the slides. Um, we, we're looking at issues that, that you have been considering for years, which is the overall uh, regulations, policies, and systems for occupational health and safety. We're taking, we, we hope 
to use this opportunity not only to highlight uh, these regulations, policies, and systems with regard to the COVID context, but also to look at how we strengthen regional and country level coordination and, and, uh, and collaboration between the different sectors in order to, to highlight the importance of occupational health and safety overall. Within WHO, Yvonne has been leading an effort to, uh, to highlight this with our regional offices and our country offices and to create those, uh, those working groups between. Um, as we're looking next at patient safety and health worker safety, one of the opportunities that we're looking at going forward is that uh, World Patient Safety Day this year will focus on health worker safety with the combined message that patient safety relies on health worker safety. So we'll highlight where those health system controls actually create the opportunity for us to improve health care overall by looking systematically at patients and at the workers who are delivering the care. You'll notice some of the statistics that we have that, um, that relate patient safety to workforce safety. In particular, the, the um, data that on average 60 to 80% of accidents actually involve human error. So we need to actually move forward this case for health worker safety among the, uh, amidst the broad case globally for worker safety, as we know you all are, are looking. Um, in terms of mental health and psychosocial support for health workers, we know that the increased demands at, on health workers at all levels within the COVID-19 response is actually creating some cross-cutting cross risks to health and mental health with regard not only to the health worker role as witness to suffering and witness to death in a way that, that most of the developed world actually isn't accustomed to seeing, that some of the low resource contexts may have seen, for example, in the Ebola context. But we're looking at some, some occupational health and safety issues that are related to health worker burnout, to health worker hours, to harassment that they, that they are undergoing in their communities, within their neighbors, and sometimes even within families. And we've developed along with a, uh, an intersectoral working group, uh, communications materials on mental health and psychosocial considerations within the workplace, as well as the interagency steering community interim briefing on mental health and psychosocial aspects, which has an integrated training that will be useful for, uh, for health facilities and managers in uh, bringing forward these considerations for their health workers. There is a psychological first aid toolkit that is directly intended for health workers and for health workers to support each other. And we uh, anticipate a stress management tool will be delivered soon, led by our mental health department. There is also a, um, a mental health and psychosocial support toolkit that will be rolled out from our regions and country offices and shared with partners. Now, I'm coming from the Health Workforce Department, and we're looking at the overall impacts of human resources for health management. On the left-hand side of uh, this slide, you'll see the, uh, a framework that we use overall to look at human resources for health management. And I'm gonna highlight quickly some elements on the right side that are specific to the COVID-19 response. I think that you'll be able to come back and look at this after the, the uh, webinar. And what we're looking at is the, inter, um, the interactivity between tools, individual factors, organizational environment, system-wide factors, and then the overall conducive environment, which is not an area where we can build capacity, but is an area where we can build understanding. So in terms of individual tools, these include prompt remuneration and overtime or hazard pay, including for contract staff. And as we know, many contract staff are coming in to support the response. It includes, of course, the appropriate use and training on PPE for health workers and for practice guidelines and job aids, which I can say that we are um, bringing out through WHO overall. We understand that there are a number of uh, organizations, academia, 
and uh, public entities that are bringing out practice guidelines and job aids, particularly in local languages. It also includes individual factors, which, in, which uh, encompass individual tasks and roles appropriate to skills and expertise. So as we're looking, for example, right now at guidance for low resource settings, there's a tendency to pile all of these on community health workers who are workers with a minimum amount of training. So what we recommend is working very closely with a vari wide variety of occupational groups to ensure that we're putting tasks appropriately on those who can perform them and who can perform them in the um, This includes training and skills refreshers, especially for retirees or for medical recent medical graduates who may be brought in to augment responses and also allocating tasks appropriately for maintaining essential health services while also responding to COVID-19. Uh, and most importantly, and I think it's an agenda that IOSH colleagues will understand, this includes decent work, which includes the wide variety of support that we've already mentioned with mental health and occupational health, and also including health workers in decision-making roles. You'll be able to review these materials that I presented at a later time, because I know that we're, we're on a tight schedule, and um, we'll look at the ILO document. Now, Yvonne, just to confirm, okay, our ILO colleague has not joined us, but there are I ILO documents to support this, uh, this response specifically, including in the acute response phase where health workers need to be covered by regulations that protect their occupational health and safety, which as, as we all know, does not exist in every national environment. So we look to IOSH colleagues to, uh, to lead campaigns and to encourage governments to ensure that these, these regulations are in fact enacted, whether in an emergency phase or as an overall approach. These labor rights are critical to ensuring the protection of health workers and from the health workforce standpoint, to the retention of health workers. We already know that we have fewer health workers than we need. We can't afford to lose them during this time uh, for any reason. So this includes engaging health worker and employer organizations. And what we would in encourage, as, as Yvonne has helpfully highlighted here, is that we, uh, we would like to engage you, and I'll, I'll put an email address where you can request um, engagement Further, in the EpiWIN discussions that we're having every Tuesday with the health sector, and the IOSH colleagues will already be familiar with those additional audiences that we're addressing through the WHO Information Network for uh, epidemiology, for epidemics rather. Uh, health worker, health sector discussions are happening every Tuesday at uh, one o'clock in Central Eastern Standard Time, and we would welcome your participation in those discussions that happen. They include a situational update, an element in focus, and Q&A, and I'll provide the email address where you can uh, request to be included on these. You'll also find the health sector uh, element right here, and I, I'm pointing at it on my screen, which doesn't help you at all, but it's the third <laughs> And we would uh, appreciate if you would visit there for some of these tools that have been highlighted, especially by Alice in the chat that uh, will guide some of the workplace recommendations and continuously are updated. Good, thank you, Catherine. Catherine, Ivan and Alice from the WHO, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts on the pandemic right now and offering further pointers towards guidance and resources that we can access. Uh, to the participants on this webinar, all of the slides that you're seeing will be made available to you to access from the iosh.com coronavirus webpage, where you'll find these uh, resources plus many more too. Uh, all of the links that you're seeing put up on the screen too by our speakers and the ones that Alice has been posting in the chat box for all of us to see will also be contained on the iosh website too. So you'll, you'll find everything there so you can go back. Um, I'd, I'd like to, uh, to, to start to get some of the questions out now from the audience, please. You know, we, uh, we, we've got a wealth of questions coming through. So I've been busy trying to scribble some notes down on some themes that, that, uh, that we want to talk about. I'm going to invite Mark Parsons, Fiona Potter, and uh, Claudio Colosio and his team to switch on their videos right now as well. 
and we can have a, a bit of a panel discussion around these questions. So, uh, so Mark, Fiona, Claudio, do please turn on your videos right now. Let's see if we can get you on the screen. Ivan, okay, if you're welcome to join us. Fiona, great, good to see you. Hi. Excellent. Okay, so uh, look, I, there's still lots of questions coming in here on masks. So this is a question to the team at the WHO first, the World Health Organization. We heard uh, Dr. Claudio Colosio talk about masks, saying that we, we've all got to get ourselves some masks and start wearing them. Uh, we're, we're imagining that already stocks are very difficult to get hold of, of, of masks of any kind across the UK and around the world in many countries. Uh, I'm imagining that for a family of three or four people, getting a sufficient stock of masks, given that the WHO advice is that these masks are disposable, we throw them away after each use. Finding a stock sufficient for a family of three or four is a difficult uh, challenge uh, in the sourcing of them and also in paying for them, I expect. Let, let's go back to this idea of washable face covers, such as a scarf or something that we create ourselves out of some fabric. Uh, World Health Organization colleagues, should, should we be going for those? Is, is washing uh, regularly a material cover a, a good alternative to a paper disposable mask? Hi, this is Alice. Thank you. I can maybe take this one. Um, we, ha we have done a lot of review of the literature that's been out there, and, and while it is very limited, we have uh, just produced last week a document called Advice on the Use of Masks, and uh, it has everything in there that you're asking about, but to put it shortly, from WHO and from the 120 or more IPC experts from around the globe, we have assessed all the evidence, and we do not find there is good evidence that would protect the wearer themselves with a cloth mask. So this is why we haven't recommended it on our end. Um, however, we do understand that some countries have chosen to go this route um, of, of uh, recommending mask use in the community and recommending cloth masks, because as we have said repeatedly, medical masks and especially respirators should be kept for healthcare workers. Mm. Um, so back to the cloth masks in the community, we. We understand that some countries have recommended these on the basis of it being used as source control. So if the person themselves may not have uh, symptoms yet, and as Dr. Colosio had mentioned earlier, we now are finding out that a lot more people than we expected are asymptomatic or maybe pre-symptomatic before they even show symptoms, they may be infectious. So for that reason, some have opted to, to recommend the cloth masks um, they don't, they, they may not uh, protect you as the wearer, but they may protect others if you are coughing or sneezing or speaking and those droplets are coming out of your mouth mm -hmm. and may be infectious. So that's our take on the cloth masks. Um, I understand, of course, the whole world is facing a, a stock supply and, and it is very hard to get them even here in Geneva. So I understand that that is an issue and, and family members at home need to understand that um, the other measures that we ha we are recommending and we are reiterating numerous times, such as hand hygiene, social distancing from those who are sick. When you do have symptoms and you may be uh, a COVID uh, patient, we do recommend you self-isolate, whether that's at home or somewhere else away from others. And so we, we recommend the use of masks for those who are symptomatic mainly. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, thanks, Alice. Let's, uh, let's bring in Fiona Potter from the Irish Health and Social Care Group. Fiona, some thoughts from you, please. Um, the hierarchy of control always puts PP as the last line, you know, of defence. And I know in the, the trust here, we're very careful to make sure that PP is worn correctly. So training, good hand hygiene, Again, it's not just about your masks, it's about your hand hygiene so that we're not transferring correct doffing, donning and doffing. It's all about training. It's all about good practice. Um, yes, we, we have had a shortage of masks and we are testing the same as Mark. We are using masks that um, are used in industry, but we're making sure that the FFP3 respirators, the actual filters themselves conform to the required standard. Thanks, Fiona. 
So I, it, it sounds like Fiona and the team at the WHO are in accordance with Claudio Colosso's suggestion that even those people that are not exhibiting symptoms right now should be wearing masks. The preference is to move towards FFP3 or surgical type masks where available and where that doesn't put stocks at risks for, for medical professionals and healthcare workers. Uh, if that's not possible or people are still worried about the impact that their use of paper masks might have, then a, a cloth face covering is a, is a line of last resort there. Um, Andrew, can I just say, FFP3 masks were used for the aerosol generating procedures only. You Thank know, you. these are for the high risk procedures, uh, probably in intensive care. care. Yeah. Sorry, I'd also like to jump in there and, and to that point and just say the WHO does not recommend persons who are not symptomatic to wear masks. So that has been our stance and, and we only recommend the medical mask or respirator N95 or FFP2 or 3 for healthcare workers. And so Thanks. for those in the community, we do not recommend masking. We just provide guidance on how to do it safely if they choose to do so in the document that I mentioned. Thanks, Alice. That's, that's useful to hear. Let's bring uh, Claudio Colosio back in. Uh, Claudio, go ahead and unmute yourself. Uh, if I may add uh, something very shortly, I think that another good reason to recommend as a ba basic uh, uh, personal protective device surgical masks is that the surgical masks are the only one which protect in both directions. They protect workers, from uh, infected people. And they protect uh, infected people from the worker because uh, they stop uh, the worker uh, contaminated the environment and they protect the worker. Uh, I, it happened uh, to me to see, even in my hospital, some nurse wearing uh, a N99 mask with a uh, uh, valve. This mask, if the patient, the person is infected, do not give any protection, uh, can spread around the virus. So this is another reason to start with the surgical mask, which by the way, is the one which lasts longer because you have to waste it when it, uh, it is evident that it is not usable anymore. Whilst the most sophisticated mask have a life of eight, maximum 10 hours. Um, so, for example, I suggest to our uh, people working in pneumology, uh, in uh, pneumology is the right word, in word, in word in English, okay? In pneumology, uh, to use normal mask and to have in the pocket the N99 or N95, and to use it just only when needed, and to take note how many hours or minutes they have used to have for a longer period. Thanks, Claudio. That's helpful. Let, let's, um, let, let's go back to the point that Fiona Potter reminded us that this is not just about wearing masks, but hand hygiene is very important too. Uh, in, uh, in the UK, we're seeing people using different types of gloves, ranging from uh, nitrile gloves to, to the types of gloves you might find uh, available, disposal gloves at, at, at the gas station when refueling our vehicles. Uh, right up to, I, I saw someone today wearing a pair of, uh, of, of waterproof ski gloves. Would the panel like to offer some thoughts about types of gloves and, and, and whether that's a good idea? When should we be using gloves and who should be using them? An open question to the panel. If anybody has any thoughts, you're welcome to, to add in. Hi, this is Alice again. I can maybe comment on this because as IPC, we've done a lot of work around uh, looking at the different type of PPE and what our suggestions should be. And like masks, we don't recommend glove use in the community. So gloves and masks should be kept for the healthcare professionals because they are hopefully getting the correct training on how to use them. Once you are recommending things to the community without proper um, training on how to use them properly, they become almost harmful as we've seen also with cloth masks. So we don't recommend glove use. No type of glove would, would 
be good because people are going around and it creates a false sense of security. So they're going around and touching everything with their gloves without being able to clean those gloves as they would normally clean their hands or they think because they're wearing gloves they can go and touch everything but not keeping in mind that those hands and those gloves are now becoming a mode of transmission of if they've picked up any contamination from anywhere. I see people at the grocery store touching food, touching their face, touching masks. So it's, it's really not recommended from an infection control standpoint to wear gloves in the community. Thank you. Let, let's narrow this back into to healthcare workers, which is the, the, the focus for this session. Catherine Kane, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about surveillance in, in healthcare. What, what thoughts can you offer here? You're on mute again, Catherine. Hi. Hi, thanks. Really be able to do that. Um, there was a question with regard to the capability for surveillance, which I think is, is quite important because um, as we talk about the use of IPC and of PPE in health facilities, it's important to understand that health workers are not just the surgeons who are treating patients, but a wide body of, of individuals. And we've actually included uh, in upcoming guidance some discussion on how to rapidly augment the health workforce. And that does indeed include managers, cleaners, IPC specialists, clerical roles, where uh, individuals who aren't specialists in respiratory interventions can also be contributing to supporting health workers in that hospital setting. So it's important when we look at, at this response, not just to look at those who are providing direct patient care, but where we can repurpose other professional groups so that they can support overall work, including surveillance. And, and in fact, there's, there's another question that I'd like to segue into here, with it, which is with regard to low, low resource settings. And these are linked. Surveillance in the communities often exists through community-based health workforce. And in fact, we are working on some specific guidance that with UNICEF right now that we anticipate will come out next week to uh, talk about what is appropriate within those low resource settings, both in terms of uh, protection and training of the health workforce, scaling up the available resources to meet community needs, and ensuring that communications to communities and to health workers are well tailored to their needs. We're reflecting on uh, communication uh, and, and community engagement techniques that use uh, pictorial job aids and use pictorial references for the communities in order to highlight and underscore those key messages. Mm -hmm. So we, we will indeed be reflecting both low resource settings and a holistic view of the health workforce where there are many opportunities to contribute uh, outside of necessarily clinical roles, but where we do need to, to do recruiting and do need to ensure appropriate IPC uh, and PPE training for those health workers in all facets. Thanks, Catherine. That, that's useful. And, and, and thanks for picking up on a couple of the threads there that, uh, that have been coming through. I want to change the, the subject just a little bit now and, and think about mental health. We, we heard a, a couple of touches on it during the speaker's discussions where we were talking about the, the psychological impact on, on people of this pandemic. So, so first to, to Claudio and the team. As, as the professionals, the medical professionals, right at the forefront of what's going on here, how are you coping? How, how, how's your mental headspace? Are, are, you, are you feeling okay? What are you doing to, to stay upbeat and positive? Okay, thank you. It's a very good uh, question. I'm not uh, an expert in mental health, so maybe Elena can help me because she's a psychiatric. But uh, I want to say that uh, just yesterday at uh, the headquarters of the region of Lombardy, where it has been created a special task force for COVID. We were discussing about the problem of phase two COVID with our uh, uh, healthcare workers. And we agreed that there is a high risk when the big crisis is finished to have uh, epidemics of exhaustion or in some cases even of burnout. Exhaustion because uh, we have been working really day, night, Saturday, Sunday, very, 
uh, let's say there was a period when I arrived home at 10 30 p.m. and the wife asked me, But Claudio, are you sick? Because it was too early for her seeing me <laughs> home at 10 30. So, exhaustion. But uh, uh, when you are uh, on the fire, you don't feel exhausted. At the end, you feel. And burnout is for those who have, de have done this uh, terrible work and felt around uh, no gratitude, no, no results from their work. So we must be very careful. Actually, what we've done is a task force together with the psychologist of the hospital, and we have created, uh, uh, relaxing rooms where you go in the dark atmosphere, there is music, uh, you can see nice slides, uh, you can even sleep a while if you want. And uh, this uh, is much appreciated. And the specific uh, support that a worker, if want, can give a telephone call. Uh, another critical problem for us, from the psychological point of view, is the worker who is in quarantine, is home, he would like to be with us working, but he is home because continuously is uh, positive uh, at the nasopharyngeal swab and is alone at home. We had, uh, in some cases, uh, just uh, to put directly in touch uh, with uh, the psychology to these people. Well, Parsons, do you want to come in and add some thoughts on this idea around uh, psychological risk and, and the impact to our mental health and well-being? Mark, are you there? Are you able to? Yeah, that's it. Got you now. Hello, Mark. We're still struggling to hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yeah, okay. Uh, I'd say we, we've been lucky within our organization, as I believe most of the NHS organizations in the UK have. We've had uh, uh, been deployed to military personnel, uh, and they've obviously involved in a lot of uh, traumatic uh, experiences uh, and they have a system which I know talking to Fiona they've uh, got trainers in her health uh, trust uh, on trim uh, because they're a great believer in uh, you know I think it, it adds on to what uh, uh, Colisio has just said is it's not only the trauma now it is further down the road but I think it's important uh, you know particularly where we get healthcare workers that unfortunately are losing their lives as part of COVID-19 and the psychological impact that that has in their colleagues. So I think it's important to get in there uh, with the right people at the right time, uh, giving the right advice and, and pointing them in the right direction. And not only the support for them, but we've got to look at the support for their families as well. Because, yeah. you know, at the end of the day, it's not just the healthcare worker, irrespective of uh, what job they're doing within the NHS. It has an impact on the whole family. Uh, you know, and I can say that from a personal experience. My son is immune compromised you know so i'm going around many healthcare settings during my working day um <clears throat> i do you know and people don't particularly want to know this but i do totally derobe when i get in i have a shower uh, to make sure that i'm uh, totally decontaminated before i even talk to him never mind uh, get within the two meter space which we do try to do the social distancing even at home uh, but I think, you know, the psychological um, uh, impact is immense, you know, and my daughter, who is a frontline nurse working on a COVID ward, uh, phoned me in tears the other night, where it took me about 50 minutes to an hour to actually get her to a stage where she felt comfortable. So, you know, I'm seeing that firsthand, and I think it is really important that we have those support services there from day one. And I don't think this will just be for six months or 12 months, it will be longer. Thanks, Mark. That's useful perspective. Let, let's uh, flip back to the WHO. Catherine Kane, some comments that you could add here, perhaps. Thanks. Uh, it, it, it may sound counterproductive when we're in an all hands on deck situation, but actually it is absolutely critical that rostering and work schedules for health workers include uh, not only appropriate rest breaks, but also include a uh, period where they take time off. We've learned this as a, a hard-fought lesson, particularly in the humanitarian setting um, where people in emergencies feel this dual challenge of responding to overwhelming needs, but at a certain point not being able to process any further. So 
the IISC guidelines that we highlighted earlier and the psychosocial first aid were developed in coordination with partners in order to address some of these absolutely critical needs of appropriate work hours, of specific rest and recuperation breaks, of mental health and psychosocial support resources available within the health facility and in a blame-free environment, as I know that Yvonne has often emphasized. And, and, and certainly looking to these examples to ensure that that exists overall within this response. We already have an 18 million gap in the number of health workers needed to deliver primary health care, which is what my department was, was focusing on prior to this outbreak. We can't afford to lose any to burnout, to suicide, to resignation from the health workforce. So ensuring that these are included, and they are included even at the WHO level. This is, it's fascinating for me, having spent 15 years of my life in emergencies, to see that WHO, even for the emergency teams, is trying to ensure that we're working appropriate hours. And I, I think that as occupational health and safety specialists, you all know this better than we do. Thanks, Catherine, for, for, for that, uh, that, that comment there. I, I think what I'm starting to see and hear in these webinars, and particularly this one today with this collaboration between WHO, IOSH, uh, and others too from different disciplines, including Claudio and the medical team over in Milan, is that uh, collaboration between disciplines and professionals is absolutely essential right now, isn't it? What, what advice... Uh, can I come... Uh, could I come in there? I work across all multidisciplinary teams with occupational health, IPC, HR, trade unions, membership, staff, and I'd just like to reiterate how the small things really do matter. I took some hand cream to the domestics because uh, it's in short supply. And I think sometimes it's just that small act of kindness that can really make a difference. It's important that you are visible, whether through team up or whether it's, you know, at a distance face to face. But, you know, a thank you card, a thank you message. We have lots of rainbows in the UK um, and we'll all come out at eight o'clock tonight to clap for our emergency services and it really does boost morale. I, I, I think you, uh, you make a great point there, Fiona. Thanks for reminding us that all of us, no matter who we are, where we are, or what we do for, for our day job, we can all make a difference by these smaller things. In fact, uh, this week I was trying to flag exactly that point in a post that I was making on LinkedIn about the life of, of the Irish president and suggesting that social distance it may be a, a misnomer it's physical distance that we're talking about it's segregating people from each other i think one thing that coronavirus gives us all the opportunity to do is reduce the amount of social distance we have i mean the the contact uh, the, the contact the connection that we have whether that's over the phone over a webinar over a video link we can all be increasing our social connections in this remote or virtual way or, or through traditional means a, a handwritten letter a telephone call, uh, finding a way to, 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 to keep people who are perhaps feeling a bit more anxiety, feeling that there's, they've got someone on their side in the same way that you've just demonstrated there with that small gift of hand cream. Uh, I wonder what, what else we can all do to, to both bring that sense of collaboration amongst professionals and also help just ease some of the pressure and the strain a, a little bit. You know, one of the things that we, we've been working on actually this week at IOSH in the presidential team is thinking about mental health and, and, and well-being, psychological impacts to, to people. Uh, and the team has put together a nice little training package, which is available for any IOSH branch or district to receive through, uh, through one of the vice presidents to come and deliver. So if that's of any interest to anyone on this webinar, you're welcome just to make contact with your normal IOSH branch and ask for that to be delivered. So let us take uh, one, uh, one or two last couple of questions here and see if we can, uh, see if we can start to pull things together. Um, th th there's some questions for, for Claudio and the team here, just once more about these telematics that you were talking about. Claudio, I wonder if you could just give us any more insight on, on whether we're likely to be able to see something that comes out on our mobile phones in the near future that allows us to, to get some more insight into what's going on. 
Uh, okay, uh, uh, let's say, I think that the telematic uh, tools are very important from two points of view. The first is creating the capacity of following hundreds, even thousand patients after hospitalization. Uh, when you put a patient, maybe an healthcare worker, maybe any other kind of patient home, if you can follow him, her, it is very important and you reduce the need of having places in the first aid department, which in these days has been crowded even more than you can imagine. We did really for the first time in our life triage. That is to decide that this guy for sure will die, so we will not nothing. This guy maybe will survive, so we do no nothing and you enter the first aid. So it is important and um, the device we are trying to adopt from Monday, if we are able to do it, is a device in which a patient can register some basic data that is temperature, oxygen saturation, respiratory rate, uh, uh, whatever. And uh, answer uh, 10 uh, point just to flag regarding symptoms. If some of this uh, uh, answer is out of the normality, then a wake up an alarm ring and the operator can immediately have a talk with the patient. Mm. And the system provides uh, statistics and every day at eight o'clock give you the list of your patient from the most severe to the less severe. This is uh, uh, for patients. The second uh, very important use of uh, the, these devices is in the phase of restarting of activity. What we call in Italy is a phase two because we know that a lot of people are still not immunized against the COVID. Uh, we must to reopen activities, otherwise we will become a country in full angriness. We must work. And so if we protect, work, protect these workers with the right personal protective device, distance, and then we give them a device simple uh, comparing to the one we give to patient, but adequate to follow people and uh, with the, um, with the Bluetooth technology to identify contacts, then you can check what's happened in the entire region. My dream is to be able to suggest something like that for a region of 10 million people, like the region of Lombardy, for example. So these are two uses of uh, these devices. Thanks, Claudio. That's, uh, that's interesting to hear. We look forward to getting more, uh, more information on those experiments as, as you continue with them. Well, it's time to draw to a close now. So, uh, so let me just say thank you to all attendees for joining us on this webinar today. Uh, as you will have noticed, Dr. Min over in China struggled with some connections into this webinar. We, uh, we hope to be able to record her slides and add them to the coronavirus homepage on iosh.com and perhaps even see Dr. Min at a future one of these webinars. Dr. Claudia Colosio over in Milan, thank you. Catherine Kane, Alice Simigiano, and Ivan Ivanov over at the WHO, thank you to the three of you for joining today. Uh, also to Mark Parsons and Fiona Potter at the Irish Health and Social Care Group. Uh, and especially to, to all of those people working in health and social care right now, we, we both salute you and thank you sincerely for, for the work that you're doing. And I'll be one of many of us in the UK this evening at eight o'clock clapping for, for the work of, of those people. So I'll end this session by saying that we'll send you all a link to the recording via email. So look out for it in your inbox. You can access this webinar at any time for a replay or to download the slides of the speakers that you've seen today. And do remember this series of webinars takes place every Thursday. So keep an eye out on our COVID-19 webinars page on the irish.com website and other IASH channels too, for example, on social media, for details about our next webinars. 
I'll be back with you two weeks today with the team at the WHO for the latest update there. Until then, I'm grateful for you joining us and taking part. Please, everyone, take care, stay safe, and be well. Thank you very much, and I wish you all a good day.